a man parks his car outside a taxi stand in Israel and he's running into Mincha because you know he couldn't find parking so that was the only in the taxi stands across the street from the shul when he comes out just a few minutes later after Mincha he notices that two calves are parked on both sides in such a way that he can't get his car out so you recall he runs over to the taxi stand uh, to the booth, you know, where the cab, cab drivers are uh, hanging out. <coughs> and he says to them, you know, knock, knock. And he can't get a response from them. <coughs> They're too busy to even uh, give them the time of day. Finally, somebody motions with the hand and tells him, wait till we finish our game of Sheshbesh. He's got to get out of there. So what does he do? He's very frustrated. He decides to call up the cab company and order two cabs. What we call in, in Israel, they call them a special. So special means, you know, take me somewhere on a long trip. For a cab driver, that's, that's Parnassa. That's more. Before you can snap your finger, the two cars are out of there. They're on their way to pick up this so-called special, this client who's not really been. And the question that we want to study tonight is, is that halakhically acceptable? Or is it objectionable? On the one hand, his car is stuck, they're not willing to move their cars and free him out of this jail. On the other hand, he's creating this whole, f this whole fantasy as if somebody was calling the cabs and there's no one there. So where, if you take, yeah. where is he heading? Does it make a difference if he's heading to a shear or if he's heading to the baseball game? Mm, not sure, but let's keep that let's keep that question in mind, okay? But I, first, I want to know what principle might apply here to give us a a clue. You know, basically, what the man is doing, he's taking the law into his own hands. Normally, if you have a gripe against someone, then you have to show up in a court. That's why we have a system of basement. He took the law into his own hands. Call it vigilante justice, if you like. So there's a sugyan bavakam. It's a world-class sugyan. You have it on the top of your page. And it's called Rabbi Yehuda Omer Lo Ovid Inishtina Danafshe, Rav Nachman Omer Ovid Inishtina Danafshe. Let's explain. According to the shita of Rabbi Yehuda, a person is not permitted to judge a case on his own. If he wants to, he can take it to Bez. Even though he's crystal clear that he's in the right, he has no doubt about it, he's got to go to Bez. That's the opinion of whom? Of Rabbi Yehud. Rav Nachman is of the opinion that of it in A person can judge by himself and implement the justice. If he knows he's in the right, he has the ability and he's within his privilege within his halakhic rights to force the issue and take the step, take the initiative on his own. The Gemara says the following, Hecha de ikap seido. In a case where he's going to take a financial loss until he gets to Bezdin and they finally hand down a verdict, you know, he's losing his money. Kuli almalopli, there's no debate the other inish dino lanafshi, even Rabbi Yehuda embraces that principle that you can judge for yourself. Take the one to your own hands. Keep pligi, where do they argue? Hecha delekap seidam. The entire machlokas between Rabbi Yehuda and, and Rav Nachman is limited to this case of lekap seidam, where there is no loss to the nizak, you know, to the person who might be damaged. And if he goes in front of Bezdin, he'll get his verdict. What difference does it make if he does it on his own or he goes to Bezdin? All things are equal. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, lo avin inishti lenafshe, kevon, delekap seida, lezel kami daina. Rabbi Yehuda's argument is, since he has no loss, by waiting and delaying, let him take it to the courts and let them hand down a verdict. He's obligated to do so, and he has no lenience and no allowance to take the law into his own hands. Rav Nachman Omar, Ovid Inish Dino A person is allowed to take the initiative on his own. 
the Cayman to be din of it, since he's in the right, lo Torah, we don't have to impose upon him, even though he has no laws, the obligation to go to court. Interesting. So now, in the case of the person who's blocked on both sides by two calves, I'm not sure, is this Ikup Seda, and therefore there's no debate, he's allowed to do it, or is it Lekup Seda, he has no loss. What would you say? The man is stuck. I mean, he, Pasha can't get his car out. He needs to get to work. <clears throat> he needs to get to work. He needs to get home. He's got to spend some time with his family. He's got to eat supper. Hopefully nothing salty. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I mean, Lechor, it's Ikem But I'll tell you what. Let's grant that it's Lechem Seder, okay? Eliezer, so let's go back to your paradigm. He wants to catch the game, right? He wants to go to see the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers defeat the uh, Baltimore Ravens, right? I was speaking on Charles Schutters at a shul in Baltimore, and you could see it on the faces of every participant. They were waiting to get out of there <laughs> to find out, who, you know, how the Ravens are doing. But thank God I kept them in because they would have been disappointed anyway. <laughs> Although after Shabbos, the Ravens were up. So let's see how we pass in Shulchan Aruch. Do you have the second source on your page? Is Shulchan Aruch Choshen Mishpat Simon Lamt. And we pass in, if you read it carefully, of an Inish Dino Lenafshe, even the Makom Afil Makom Sheelo Hefset, Achielich Lifnea Dayon. Even if he has no laws. So truth be told, Elias, it doesn't really matter whether he's going to work or he's going to a football game. In both cases, of an inish, he's in the right. I don't have to wait till, uh, you know, till uh, Bezdin gets, gets to hand down the verdict. But who determines if he's in the right? He's allowed to determine that for himself. That's the fascinating thing about of an inish in an option. If you're wronging me, you, in my opinion, again, if I, if I don't know, you the know. It's not meant to be so subjective. What do you say? The law is not meant, halacha is not meant to be so subjective. But some cases are obvious. I mean, I'm banging down the doors here, and they're in the middle of Sheshbesh, you know, with all due respect. But what right do you have to, 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 cons to uh, block me from getting out? But what is the definition of hepsid? I mean, basically, hepsid means anything that I would pay for if I could only get out of it, you know, it, it's, it's such a, a loss to me that I could put a price tag on. Clearly, if your shar kills my, my para, that's, that's worth a price tag. But even other things that I would pay for, you know, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you can't get your car out because somebody, some, pardon the expression, idiot, you know, is playing shesh and he doesn't want to let you get out. You know, it's not as if, you know, somebody had to block you and there was no other choice. You, you, have, you have noted that the guy shouldn't have parked there. No, I'm not saying that he shouldn't have parked there. He's in a taxi stand. <clears throat> no, well, he's, he's outside, outside the taxi stand. You see, in Israel, not in taxi. I don't know if, David, you've ever seen it. It's called the Mifrat. So Mifrat is this broad area that's near the taxi stand. The taxi drivers like to take it over. Right. Truth is that maybe they have rights to three spaces, four spaces, but it's a wide... Sp now, Again, I don't think on the normal circus he would have parked it because he wouldn't have wanted to take the chance that somebody was going to block him out. But he was in a rush. That doesn't give a taxi driver the right to block him out. It's public area. Okay. Again, if he was illegal about it, that's a whole other story. But you change one fact and add one and another fact. Let's say they're... Uh they're not playing uh, Shakespeare, but they're listening to your shir on kosher tube. You know? They're watching your shir in the taxi station. Right. That, so then, so is he still in the right? And maybe that'll determine, it'll depend on whether he's going, trying to rush to either work or his own shir or right. the baseball game. I, I don't right? think, <coughs> you know, I, it's very nice that he's listening to a shir, but I don't think that would be a justification for his not taking a break in order to move the car. In fact, I don't think he was in the right to put his car there to begin with. It's not as if this fellow was taking up two spots or something, you know. Sometimes you get angry at someone, they, or he parked illegally. That's not the case. The case is that the taxi drivers, they decided that's the easiest place for them to park for whatever reason. They don't want to start looking around in the area for another parking spot. Now, there's one point I want to make here about this story. 
and I think I may have hinted at this last time, I don't remember if we did or we didn't. When he calls up the cab company, and he says, come pick me up at such and such an address, let's say the cab company, the taxi stand is in Yerushalayim, can he send, he, can he send him out to Telstar? You know, all he needs for his purposes is to have them move the car. Two blocks away. Two blocks away or one block, it doesn't matter. Just move it a few inches away. And if you're not willing to do so, I'm going to take the law into my own hands. But there might be a limit to the extent to which he has to achieve his goal. Now take a look at the third I mean, source. Sending him to Telstone is malicious. Correct. That's already Nakama. You know, that, that you're not allowed to do. That's not Ovid Inishtin al And I want to demonstrate this to you because it, it's so beautiful to see this in the sources of Chasal. The Gemara says as follows, Toshma, the Avis of Gemara, Baba Kama, Chavches Amad Al. The Gemara says, Shar Sha'ol Al Gabi Chavero Lahargo. Your ox is on, literally on top of mine and, and, and is crushing mine to death. Ubar Bala Tachton, the owner of the Nizak, yeah, the Shar that's, that's, who's, the shah whose life is in danger, Vishamat Eshalo, he pulls out his ox from the bottom. What is this called when you pull something out on the bottom and the top one falls? I don't know, there's a word for that, no? Okay. Vishavinafal Elyon Vames. So as a result of this action, the upper shore, the top shore, dies. Now normally, if you do such a thing, that's called Adam Muad You have to pay for Mazik. Potter. Why is he Potter? Because it's a Pseidah, it's a Hefset. And in this case, even Rabbi Yehuda would agree that Ovid Inish Dino Lenach. Again, I'm not going into all the details here of the sugi about a short time and a short mood, whether he gets chatzin, nezik, or nezik sholem, and why it's a psaid. The Gemara says, but let's look at the second half of that price, or what's called the seifa. Dochafoli elyon vames chayev. In other words, instead of pulling out his shar, he pushed the top shar and it died. It fell and died. In such a case, he's chayev. What's the difference between the first case and the second case, the ratio and the seifa? Why is it that in the ratio, when he pulls his shar away and the top shar dies, he's potter, but if he pushes the top shar to save his bottom shar, his own shar, he's chayev. So the says, am I chayev? So the says, hayalo l'shamto v'lo shamto. He should have pulled out the bottom shar because What's the difference between pulling out the bottom shore and pushing the top shore? One is calling the taxi two blocks away and one's calling it to Telstone. Okay. You've got to mitigate your loss. You've got to mitigate it as, Correct. as exactly. minimally as possible. Excellent. You limit the loss because if you pull out the bottom shore, the top shore will fall, but maybe it won't die. But if you push it in such a way that it's going to go off the top, that's a whole different story. So once again, I think the principle that we're deriving here is that even if you're claiming of an inish thing I'm going to take the law into my own hands, but do it in such a way that you limit the, the loss to the other person, achieve your goal, but only what's absolutely necessary in terms of the cause, the loss you take. Clear? So therefore, if you can gain your achievement, as you said earlier as before, by simply calling the cab a block down, I'm going to get the cab's not going to come for a block, but, well... No, yeah. no that, that, that's not right. Yeah, it's it's a correct. Twenty mile trip. Trip. Right. Right. trip. Right, right, You can tell him it's a long yeah. trip. As soon as he sees you're not there, you know, you can even move your car and then call him up and say, "Oh, I apologize." You know. Uh, okay. So that's that's what I wanted to tell. Again, all this is predicated on the assumption that he's parked in a place where he's allowed to park. I, I have a question about this whole thing, which comes back to his thing. <coughs> You are, it's the ultimate conflict of interest the situations that okay, in the, the examples we've given they've been fairly clear cut it's almost malicious the guys are playing cards, he's begging to get out and they're ignoring him right. it's, their behavior is almost malicious one, one might say so his action, his judgment here is a reasonable judgment 
<clears throat> but from the point of view of the person making the judgment, right, generally people give themselves the benefit of the doubt making judgments. You know, he's doing me wrong. Right? I'm going to act on it. As a rule, we don't think this is a good idea. As a rule, we don't think that we're objective making these kind of judgments. Somehow here, we're saying, yeah. you. And it's saying it has to be clear. But yeah. it's clear to a person who has an in built-in prejudice. The individual is being wronged. Right? If you're putting yeah. your object in such a place where it shouldn't be, and it's causing me inconvenience, then get it out of there. I'm, again, I warned you, I asked you, gathering. I was very nice about it. He didn't come yelling at the cab drivers, you know, back. He said, please, you know, move the car. And that's if, what he's allowed to do. If they're gathering for some reason... Once they've gotten the, the If they're you know, gathering the for some reason is uh, involves saving a life, right? They're on the phone, they're doing something, whatever, okay. raising money to save a life, whatever the reason is, right? And we don't know what it is, right? He perceives it to be a shash -bash game. Right. right. That's what he perceives. But in fact, it isn't, right? Okay. You know. But David, look at the other option. The other option is, again, I'm, I'm seeing with my own eyes the playing Shesh Or he says to me, we're in the middle of the Shesh game, don't bother me. So I have to think that he's saving a life? And the alternative is... Don look up suits. Okay, but the alternative <laughs> is that every single case, in every situation, if you think about your life, again, maybe here in Canada people are very, very nice. I don't know. But I come from New York, you know, originally. <laughs> now we live they, in Israel. nicer here. I grew up yeah. in New York. So I can't, tell, I, I can't tell you that in New York things like this don't happen almost on a regular basis. At what point do we finally say, we banish them, I can't wait to go to, to go to court. And imagine how the courts will be over overlogged with work. So there is a principle called Ovid Ishti Lenafshi. Again, there are some very important conditions here. Number one, you're suffering a loss, or even if you're not suffering loss. B, he's in the wrong. C, you notified him and he doesn't want to move his wares. D, you're doing it in the most minimum way possible to limit the loss that he takes. But let me go on to the next case. I mean, if you think calling up a cab to, to pick me up when I'm not going to be there for me to pick up is bad, what about this case? Okay, this is the next I, case. I, 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 before you get to it, I have a question. The cab driver notes the guy's plate as he goes off to pick up the fare. Right? <clears throat> and he does drive out of the way, and he loses a fare in the process of doing it. Right? Now, he's got a grudge. It cost me 20 bucks to go somewhere where I didn't have to go. And you caused me to do that. Right? I'll say so. Next time, right. don't play chess pass, or don't block my car. Again, it's all predicated on the fact that you are the mazik and I'm the niza. If you're not the mazik, then there's no Ovid in the Nafshe. Like the classical case of Ovid in the Nafshe, again, it's a complicated sugi, it's got many parts to it, but is a person decides he's laying out his wares across, across the right. highway. Put it on the other angle. Who asked you to block the way? This is a public thoroughfare. So again, I, I warn you, I speak nice to you, and you're taking your pretty time. I got to get to work. I got to get to my wife and then spend, uh, spend the evening with her. I'm not going to... So I have the right to do, again, in the minimal way. I'm not going to start smashing your, your things. If there's the, maybe but my ox can walk over your... your if there's, yeah, that's right. My ox can, can smash your, your, your wares. Okay? And that's why I showed you in Shulchan Aruch that that's how we passed it. Well, let's go on to another case so we get a bit, a bit of a broader picture. Here's an interesting case. Do you see where it says in the middle of the page, Morach Ra'al Akbarim al Do you remember this case? I'm not sure if we discussed it. This is an interesting case. It's a case of a student in an American university. Day after day, he brings his lunch so that he can take a lunch break and have the energy to go on in the day. And day after day, somebody, somebody steals his lunch. And it gets to the point where the students are laughing at him. You're like, you're a, you're a loser, so to speak. But he really is a loser because he can't, he can't eat lunch. So he has a brilliant idea. That day, he spreads rat poison inside his sandwich. And as a result, they find out who the Ganev is because they rush this guy to the hospital and only by miracle do they save his life. Is he within his rights to do so? Can he take the law to his own hands in order to catch the Ganev and put the Ganev's life into danger? 
What would you say about it? Again, just shoot from the hip. I don't know if you got a chance to see to see the Gemara above the Kama that we're about to look at. Uh, seems a little uh, draconian. Okay. Yeah, he could have spread X lights on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> All right. But here's an interesting Gemara. I want you to see this mission. Tonight. Do you have it? Karim Ravai. Now, let me just give you a little background to you. I mean, again, I assume you all know this, but just in case. In Eretz Yisrael, we have something called Revat. That means the fruits of the tree in the fourth year, as so this week we have two so this is all relevant to two In the fourth year, it's called Revai, which means it has the same Kedusha, the sanctity of Meiser Shein. It has to be brought to Yerushalayim and eaten by Kedusha Batar in Yerushalayim, or you have to be poda it, and you do redeeming, and then you can eat it outside Yerushalayim. Now, I own a field. How do I notify the public, hey, stay away, you know, this is Revai, that nobody should eat it outside of Yerushalayim. So the Mishnah goes through all the dinam of Zerayim and tells you what symbols they used. So in the case of Revai, it says, Hayyumitsainim oso bikazuzos adoma. Okay, what's kizuzos adoma? Adoma means earth. Earth is where you plant something and it grow and you grow something. Ma adoma ika hanomine, since you can get some benefit out of this adoma. So adoma, a clump of, of, of land, of of, uh, of soil, is symbolic of something that has produce. Af hainami, this netarivai. Kimefarka, if you uphold it, shari lishanuye mine, you can get benefits from it. Okay? So once again, you are using this symbol to warn the person that this has Kedushas Revai, and he shouldn't eat it outside Yushalayim unless he's poded it. Shel Orla, what if he has fruits of the tree during the first three years it's producing trees, which means it's Orla. What can you do with Orla? Nothing. It's also about not. You can't feed it to your dog, you can't give it as a gift to a guy, nothing. So there, becharsis. You put out a piece of cheres. Cheres is a, a piece of china. Ma charsis she'en hanomine. Charsis is made of a type of, of, of uh, offer. I say offer of, uh, I wouldn't call clay, it yeah. soil, but uh, clay. She, that you can't, you can't plant anything in it. You can't get any benefit from it. So there's no hano from it, and that's a symbol of Arla that you can't get any hano from it. <laughs> Shelk vuros, let's say you have the dead are buried in a certain place, and you don't want a Kohen to accidentally go in there. Besid, so you put out something which is very white. How do you say in English, Sid? Plaster. Simona, why is that a simon of a base akvaros? The chir katsomos, because it's white like bones. Umam cheve shofech ki hechi din chavritve. And even after mixing this plaster, extra water to make it even more white. Amar Reb Shimon Gamliel, ba medvar mamurim. When does the mission require that you put up these signs, these warning signs? Bishvias on the seventh year of the Shemitah cycle, the Hefkin in him, because then anyone's allowed to come into his field and eat the fruits. And he might come to violate the Iser Arla, or he might come to violate the Iser of Revai, or he might, if there's a burial place there, he might be a Kohen and, and be Metami himself. Abel Bishar Shnei on other years of the Shemitah cycle, what right does he have to come in and take your fruits? If he takes your fruits, what is he? He's a Ghana. He's a Ghana. Is Halitehu le Russia the Yomus? Let him take it and let him die. Hatsnuim, Tsnuim means those Hasidim who were super duper. <laughs> They used to put mo's down, coins, and they used to say, Omer, they declare, if somebody takes from this, let's say, 
they didn't want anyone to possibly violate the Easter of Ravai. They would redeem it. Right? And they would okay. redeem it. Again, a conditional redeeming that if somebody takes it, let it be redeemed on this. So that the most, they would treat as Meister Shani, as Netaravai, and the person who eats these fruits would not violate Netaravai. But that doesn't work for Orla. No, it wouldn't help you for Orla, but it would help you for Netaravai. But what do you see from the fact that the Mishnah says Tznuim? It's not like somebody's arguing with Rav Shem Gamliel. Rav Shem Gamliel says you're not obligated during the six years of the Shemitah cycle to put out this sign. Hey, beware, this is, uh, this is Ravai. Nobody argues with Rav Shem. They're More only than pointing that, he says they can die. That's and right. They die. And he's only saying that the Tznuim, we call them the Super Dupa, they would do this whole, this whole, organize this whole system of, of, a, of a conditional pigeon so that they would, nobody would violate, they, they're so in love with God Almighty, they don't want any violation of God's law and, and, and the chilul and the desecration of Kedusha's Maishu Shani, so they did this whole thing. Therefore, if we come back to square one, what about putting, <laughs> excuse me, putting uh, rat poison on the, on the sandwich? Who's going to suffer from this rat poisoning? Going to eat it and die. The Ghana is halitani for the Russia, the others. But the truth be told, I don't think it's a proof at all. I'll tell you why. Halitani Virosh of Yomus is not to be taken literally. What the Gemara means to say is that I don't have to go out of my way to protect myself from causing someone to violate a crime if he's a criminal anyway. If he's going to go ahead and do this crime, then I don't, have to, I don't have to go out of my way to save him from a worse crime. But the Gemara is not saying literally Virosh. It doesn't mean that you can put his life, put him to death for the violation of the Isaac Zela. Clear? So that I don't think is a proof. But here I have another source for you. And I think I've told you in the past that there's a sefer called Torah Chashashurai from Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein. And he quotes, I was not able to find this, a brysa called Derech Eretz Rabba. And listen to the brysa. It's very short, so you know you don't have to. Maisa Rabbi Yoshua Shehishkim Eitzel Etzlo Ad. Some person off the street comes into Rabbi Yoshua and he's asking for a place to eat, a place to sleep. Nasalo Achila Ushasia. Rabbi Yoshua fed him, treated him royally. The hello Lagag Lishka. And he put him up on the roof, where you'll soon see in a minute, he had a lot of expensive stuff up there, and he let him sleep. But what did he do? Vinatal Sula Mitaktov. He took away the ladder. So the guy would have no way of getting down. Why do you think he did that? I mean, you'll soon see in the story. I'm just seeing if you can guess it on your own. He wanted. What did he suspect this guy of? That he might be a thief. Exactly, that it might be a thief. Ma Osa Osa Ish, the Gemara says, what happened in that story? He wakes up halfway through the night. This guy is, uh, is a burglar. He wanted to go down. He puts his foot down to go to descend the ladder. He fell off the roof. Literally, that means he broke his, uh, his backbone. But I don't know if it means it literally. I'm not sure. Lishachris Hishkim Rabbi Yoshua Ba. Rabbi Yoshua comes and he finds this guy. Shu Nofil. Omelo Reka. Reka means you're an imbecile. Kach Osim Bene Odom Shev Bekam Oscha. This is the way you behave. Omelo Rebbe Lo Isi Oder Shana Talta Es Hasula Mitachta. He, you know, like he, he makes it sound like he's an innocent guy. Well, I didn't know why. Why did you take away the thing? Omelo Reka. What are you, an imbecile? From the time you showed up last night, we were careful and we were suspicious. From this story, Rabbi Yeshua made the declaration, 
if somebody comes around and you don't recognize him, you can't identify him, be careful. Suspect him of being a listener. But Yeshua sure was suspicious of him, and then he was about to walk off with all the wares. But nevertheless, even though you suspect them, you should give them covenant. You, know, you have to work on both sides. So when I learn this brisa, this story of Rabbi Yeshua, he took away the ladder. You know, this is no longer, you know, exposing netter vai to some ganav who comes in and takes my fruits. We're not just talking about some spirit, some some religious uh, ritual violation. We're talking about endangering his life. I mean, a person could fall off a roof and die. What do you say? Is it a proof or not? It's a very dangerous proof. You know. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, it's the, definitely I, dangerous. I, well, I like that, if, if, that choice of words. If the guy is not a thief, if he's not a thief, let's say, you know, he wants to use the washroom. Breaks his back. No, I assume there was a washroom up, 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 up on the roof. Otherwise, you know. Otherwise, you're right. I mean, he could be the innocent guy, and then he kills himself. Or he wants to leave early in the morning not to bother his host. You know, just thank you very much. Leave a little note. Off he goes. You know, he doesn't have to make him breakfast. Mm -hmm. He's just a very polite, somewhat shy guy. Right? Right. He's lying there at the bottom of the thing with a broken back. Right. With no kalim in his pocket. Mm -hmm. It's a very... So you have a cash on of Yeshua. Yeah. I don't know exactly how to answer that question. How did he know that, uh, you know, did he, did he post a guard there to make sure that uh, if, if he doesn't see him steal the thing, he would save him? I don't know. But be that as it may, is Rabbi Yeshua saying that if, if you go ahead and steal my Caleb, I can put your life into danger? Is that what Rabbi Yeshua is saying? It seems that way. It seems that way at the surface. But I would, susp I would suggest the following. I, I don't know. Maybe what Rabbi Yeshua thought was that the guy would realize that he has no exit. He's not going to just walk, you know, walk in the dark into into a ladder, you know, onto a ladder without the ladder being there. A person is careful the way he walks. How does he know the ladder is secure and so forth and so on? Rabbi Yeshua didn't mean to put his life into danger. Rabbi Yeshua meant to say, when you're ready to go down, give a holler so that I know that you're not stealing my caleb. I, I don't believe for one moment that you're allowed to put a person's life into danger, even if he's stealing your sandwiches. I'm not justifying him for stealing sandwiches. But, you know, this of an Inish I understand that maybe I can even break your kalim in order to get by, or call you on a, on a false, uh, you know, taxi call in order to get, get your car to move. But therefore, I can put a, a person's life into danger? I mean, the Torah says, Lo Samen al Dam in fact, some some posts can hold the law. Some of the comes under a harikval yavor. This is a cardinal sin. I mean, in, in the case that's described is a case where he would die if they didn't rush him to the hospital and somehow miraculously save his life. You're going to kill somebody for stealing your sandwiches. I don't know that anyone could justify of an inishtina lenafshe to that extent. But here I want to ask you a different question. This, I thought, was a really good case. A man owns a company, many, many workers, and notices day by day, day after day, things are gone, things are missing. And the truth be told, the people who work in that office are suspicious of one particular individual. Why doesn't the employer fire him? He has no clear-cut evidence. He didn't catch him, as you say, do you say that? Red-handed. Red -handed. Red -handed. Okay, good. Al-Kham, it's called Smoking in modern Hebrew. Red-handed. So the boss decides on a plan. What he's going to do is, he's going to get a hold of an awful wad of dollars, cash, something that would tempt anyone, He's going to leave it in a drawer exposed to sight. He's going to call in this guy for a meeting. And in the middle of the meeting, he's going to walk out. And not only that, he's got a camera 
what is it called, a uh, closed circuit camera, whatever they call it, to watch what's going on over here. What would you say about that? Can you, artif- you know, like artificially create a, um, oh, my English tonight is not due to a malkoda, it's called a, uh, a, trap? a trap. To trap the Ganov so that he'll try again to steal, but this, this time you'll catch him red-handed. Shoot from the hip. I don't want you to think too deeply, because maybe you'll guess my answer. But I think if you shoot from the hip, you'll get the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not fair because yes, then you, you can. Can, then you get to think again. Right? What would you say? Why can't you? Why not? Right? This Lakhara, this is a wonderful case. I, I think it's a great plan. He should get, you know, a couple of talashim, a couple of stars on his thing for coming up with this plan. He's gonna catch the gun of red handed, as we say. The only the only well, question yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is he is putting a stumbling block in front of us. Exactly. And since you were here at the last year, <laughs> Rabbi, so what was that Isu? Do you remember what it's called? To put a stumbling block in front of a blind person? Lifnei Iver. This is a case of Lifnei Iver. Am I allowed to deliberately put a person in a temptation that might lead him to do another criminal act simply because I want to achieve my goal? Can I violate Lifnei Iver and tempt him for this greater goal? So guess what? This is a suit. Mom is straight out of the Gemara. Take a look on your page, and you'll see Kedushin Daf Lamed Beis Omenal, the second source before the end of the page. Rav Huna wanted to test his son by the name of Rabba, Rabba Bar Rav Huna. He's a very famous Amora, and put him in a situation where he might get angry. This was part of a moral training, and he wanted to test his son to see if he would get angry, uncontrollably angry. What did he do? He took shirayim, shirayim are expensive, let's say, um, silk garments, woven garments, and kara shirayim beyond pei rabbin. He took rabbin's own personal possession and ripped it. Omar, he declared, Ezel, Ichze, I will go and I will see, I will check out. I rasach, I lo rasach. Is my son going to get angry or is he not going to get angry? So the Gemara asks the following question. Again, he's doing it for a great good. Vidilma Rosach, but maybe Rabba's going to get angry. And if he gets angry in front of his father, he might even say something, you know, if your father rips your clothing, you know, you might say something very humiliating to your father, very disparaging. And that's a violation of Mora Abin. Vika'avar, and now Rav Huna, for setting this up, violates al Lifnaiva lo Sitein Michshol. Because he's causing his son to get angry, and maybe to insult his own father. So if I were to stop here, what what impression do you get? Are you allowed to put someone in a situation where he will be tempted, unless he is a super, you know, overcomes his, to violate an Easter, and I'm doing it for a greater good? It seems like you're not allowed to do so. And the Gemara says, so why did Rav Huna do so? Demachalei liyakare. Rav Huna was mochel, his kavod, before he did this. That's interesting. A father could be mochel on his kavod, he could waive his, his, uh, his demand for respect. So Rav Huna said already, he made a declaration, or a mental declaration, that if Rabba, heaven forbid, will insult me, I'm mochel. So that Rabba re- never really does an avera by insulting his father. So Rabba was allowed, I'm sorry, Rav Huna was allowed to test his son Rabba in such a circumstance where they would, even in the worst case scenario, again, he would determine whether he's a kaisan, whether he gets angry, but there would be no negative repercussions because he was mochah. Tosis doesn't like it. He says this Gemara is very problematic. 
Mechila is not enough to remove the Iser of Lifnei Ivel Osite Miksha. Why? Says Tosis, because Rabbah doesn't know that his father was Mochel. So in Rabbah's mind, what is he guilty of? If he starts going ballistic and he gets angry and he says he hurls some very harsh words in his father's direction, then what would you say about that? Violated Kibbutz. But wait a minute, but his father was Mochel. He didn't know that. He doesn't know. So what do you say? So you have to be a gigantic scholar to know the answer to this question. What happens when a person thinks he's in violation of everybody, but he's not in violation? I think that this meat is trick, but it's kosher. I don't know if you ever had such an experience where you had something that was questionable, but you ate it anyway. But thank God you lucked out and it was kosher. Are you exonerated from any punishment? You still have to bring. How do you know? How do I know it? No, you're right. But yeah. in this you have to be a tremendous tabloch to know the answer to this. That I'm not, but I learned it. I learned okay, it. so it's a Gemara and Kiddush. Yeah. It's on the Pasuk in Pashas Matos Vashem Yislach What happens? A young girl takes a vow. Her father, when he hears the vow, can do one of two things. He can either be Mekayimit or Mefred. She didn't know that her father was Mefred the Ned. And she violated the vow. So take a look at the Gemara. Isha Hefera Isha means her husband, was Mefer the Neder. He completely null, null and void the Neder. Vashem Yislach And God will eventually forgive her. Ma'ak Hosem what's the case? Be Isha Shenadra ben Nazir, Vashem Abayla Vahefer Lo, Vahilo Yoda, Shefer Lo Abayla, Voices Shosei Yaina Vatam Lameisim. She didn't realize that there was Afara here. She never found out about it. And she violated her vow. But she didn't really violate the vow because there was hafar. Rabbi Akiva was so upset about this that he started crying. And he says, Uma Mishan is Kavin Lechel Basar Chazir, the Olabi Yodu Basar Tle, Amra Torah, Tzricha Kaparu Slicha. If you ate kosher meat, thinking it was non kosher, you have to have Kapar and Slicha. How severe, how harsh is the divine judgment in a case where a person intended to eat non-kosher meat, and that's exactly what he did. So therefore, Tosas, take, take a look on the second side of your page, back in the Sugi of Kedushin, remember that Rav Huna was testing his son Rabba, so he was mochal on his kavo, says, Tosas, what's going on over here? Hashem Yislach lo. Even if Rabba had no technical violation of, of, of Mora Aviv because his father was Mochel, he wasn't aware of that. So from Rabba's perspective, he was violating Mora. How then can Rav Huna put his son, expose his son to this danger of insulting his father, even with Mechilo, but Hashem Yislach Lo. Rabba's not aware of the fact that his father was Mochel. Then Rav Hun is really violating Lifnaivir. So Tos is so impressed by this question that he says, Tsarich Lomar, you're forced, you're compelled without a choice. Shehodio Kodim Lachem. He must have told Rabba beforehand that he was Mochel. Does that sound a little strange to you? <laughs> If he told well, it him, he, the, 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 the does that defeat the whole purpose? If he yeah. told him he's being mochel. So now I'm testing you, right? It's a, basically right. what he's saying. Right. Yeah. So the Yavit says, that's uh, Rav Yaakov Emdin, you have that a little in one line, he says, Afilu hachi havi bedika. Nevertheless, it's a meaningful test. Why? Lameda iras chanahu. Mishim demshas rischa kovid. He says that if when a person is, is an angry person, and now he sees someone ripping up his clothes, you know, even if he knows that there's, uh, there's mechila built in, he's still going to get angry if he's an angry person. You know, if he's able to, super, with a superhuman effort to overcome the natural response of anger, then he passed the test. But that makes him a very unique person on this. But let's just summarize what we're saying and get back to our original question. We asked if the employer is allowed to invite the suspect, the suspected thief, 
into his office and set it up in such a way that this guy is going to steal the money. And what seems to be the answer? He's not allowed to do it, it's Lifta Iver. But maybe I have a solution. Let him be mocha. Let him make it half care. Let him take a bunch of dollars that'll be tempting enough for this Ganav to steal it. The Ganav won't realize that the Balabayit, the uh, CEO of the company, was mafkir the, the dollars, but it's worth it for him to catch the guy, as we said, red-handed. He would be allowed to do that. So again, even if you'll argue he can't do it because of Lifnaiver, he's going to tempt the guy to steal it. But in this case, since he made it Hefker, it's ownerless, then the fellow won't be stealing it. How can he make it Hefker in his office, though? Oh, so that you have to know the laws of Hefker. You mean that maybe he has to, he has to take it out of his Chatzar because right. Chatzar is Kona. But let's say if a person says, I don't want my Chatzar to be Kona, he can make such a declaration. So what's the answer? Why would it still be prohibited even if he would say that these dollars are Hefker? Because the employee doesn't know. Exactly. And what does it come under? I just want to get you to you know, teach, teach the terminology so that you speak like a big, big lamb. Vashem Yislach Lo. That's how it's called. You can talk to any Yeshiva Bakr who's a scholar and say Hashem Yislach Lo. Right away, he knows this Gemara because Rashi quotes it in Chumash. According to Tosfat, the, the CEO would have to invite the employee in and then tell him, or according to one of the sources, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. and by the way, these dollar bills over here, I made them hefker. Right, but then that would defeat the whole purpose. Right. So in the case of the Yavit, the same, but, but the no. In the case of the Yavit says, well, if he's going to be angry because he sees with his eyes that his shirayim, that his beautiful clothing is getting ripped up, if he's an angry guy, he's going to get angry anyway. Irrelevant to the mechila or not. Even if I tell you, son, I'm going to be mochel you if you get angry, but you know, try to control yourself. You're going to still have to go through this process of controlling yourself. So the medika, the test is still a good test. But the two are different. These two tests are quite different. Right? But, <clears throat> but do you agree that in the There's case no where he makes, the, he makes the money Hefker, if he notifies the guy that it's Hefker, I mean, that's, that's definitely defeating the purpose. Yeah, what I'm saying is... In he the wants case, to catch him hot. In the case, you know? in the case of the, the, the sun and the garments, there is an element where he may still lose it if he's that kind of person, or he may right. still get angry. In the case of making the money Hefker, if he puts the money in his pocket, he's not stealing. Correct. So then we defeated so that whole purpose. You, you want to catch anybody. him. You haven't catch him red-handed. So that's why I'm telling you that even though we started, and I, I, I deliberately tried to evoke a particular response that this is a great idea, why not catch him red-handed? Set it up in such a way that if he's a Ghanav, he's going to take the money. And the answer is, I think it's a violation of Lif Naiver. And Tosa says that even in the case of Rava, who was being put into this situation for a great reason. Rav Huda was making a, 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 an important you know, a moral disciplinary training period with him and trying to get him out of this, this period. But nevertheless, he wasn't able to do, he wasn't allowed to do it, Rav Huna, even if he were to be mochel on his covet, because Vashem Yislach. So again, I think, just to summarize some of the things we've been saying tonight. In the case of calling two cabs to get them out of there, I think it's absolutely mutter. Lefiani is daid. Because of it in Ishtin and Afshay, even Shalom and Makum say that, how much more so Makum say them? Be very careful to minimize the damage. Don't call them out to, uh, to Tel Aviv. You know, call them around the block. That's number one. But in the cases of pouring, you know, of, of uh, how should, not pouring, what's the word? Uh, Spread. Of spreading, of spreading, uh, sure. you know, poison, smearing poison on the on the sandwiches to catch the ganav, that for sure is prohibited. Notwithstanding the case of Rabbi Yeshua, which he quotes, that he took away the 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 sulam because there I think he took away the sulam, thinking that the guy when he has to come down will holler and yell, so he has him in a sense incarcerated, but certainly not to expose him to a danger of his life, because that's lo evil, that's lo saman al and case number three, and here I think it's a big chiddush, to say that the employee, the employer, excuse me, is not permitted to tempt the employee in order to, for the better good of catching him red-handed because he's violating Lifnaiva. But you're only tempted if, if your inclination is to steal. 
if you're in the CEO's office and he leaves a drawer open with a wad of hundred dollar bills, the employee who's honest would realize, oh, that's 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 his. But like, no, that's like, not true. Why is that leak naive? First of all, it's not true. Yeah. No, it's, I'm just saying. Let's assume he's right for just one moment. Yeah, you know, another person wouldn't be tempted to steal the money. But let's assume even if you're right. But still, what you're doing is you're putting him in a position where he will violate another Avera. It's not enough that he violated the Avera by stealing a, you know, a computer or whatever, a little thing. I, I don't mean little in terms of its value. But f to have him now steal your money, that's an additional Avera. That would be with naive. What, what are you trying to say? That you're, it's not with naive air no, the because greater, the greater good here is that you're trying to catch a thief and prevent whoever the actual thief is. You're not sure if he's the thief or not. Right. You've just heard from rumors and hearsay that this right. is the thief. Right. So you're trying to set up a reasonable test to determine if he is the thief to prevent whoever the th thief really is from stealing further property and other people's belongings. So you set up this test. It's only leaf naive if the person's actually the thief. If the person's not the thief, okay, he's not well, let's person, say he is the thief. He's not going to steal it. Let's say no, he is the thief. Wait, then the, the, the Gemara says even by Rabba, let's say he's a he's he's a raschino. He is an angry guy, right? Nevertheless, I, I violate leaf naive by 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 putting a situation where he'll get angry, and the avera that's that's implied. So again, the fact that you have a natural inclination to do the avera doesn't lift alleviate me of my 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 prohibition in joining me from exposing you to that Avera. Like in the case of Ravuna. Ravuna was only allowed to do it because he was Mochel. And even so says Tosi has to go a step further and tell his son that he's Mochel. He's also, so there's no Avera whatsoever. He has to completely liquidate the Avera. Here also, if I'm tempting, if I'm actively tempting the Ganov, I'm putting him in a situation where he will violate, if he doesn't overcome, that, that Avera. Really, your only option is to just bring him into your office and point blank ask him, are you the person who's I don't know. Story? I don't know. I didn't, you, the truth is, Elias, I didn't get to the point where I tried to come up with an alternative plan. No, there is no. Actually, if you do that, you're, you're tempting him to lie. You're right, tempting, you're <laughs> right. right. No, no. What I'm, all I'm trying to say is that I was, my purpose in, in, in preparing this class was to try to evaluate a particular plan under halachic supervision. How does the, if we look at this through the microscope of halacha, would he be allowed to do this? I, 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 frankly, I didn't give any thought to that other question. So I, I, would, I would close the tape and we could have a discussion about what other, what other options he would have in order to catch the guy, uh, you know, and, and, and convince himself that this guy's the guy of. But I don't think that would be part of at least the shear as I prepared it. The shear as I prepared it was, are you allowed to put someone, for the sake of a better good, not just in a situation where he will be tempted to violate an affair? And I think from Tosis's perspective, certainly you're not allowed, you're not allowed to do that. Okay then?